this kind of argument that uh, people should pay more just because, don't you realise how high my costs are? People don't care. I'm Danny Vallant and this is Dirty Linen, the podcast that takes the issues the hospitality industry finds hard to air in public and shakes them all about. This week on Dirty Linen, we're talking about hospitality business models. What works, what doesn't, what's harder than it used to be, and how can COVID be an opportunity to do things differently for the better? Ken Bergen is a hospitality consultant who reckons he's stopped hundreds of hospo wannabes from sacrificing their own homes and futures for a starry-eyed food dream. He's a realist and a numbers guy who loves helping people see the beauty and the necessity of a nice spreadsheet. He sees the pandemic as an opportunity to reset and refocus. Ken, it's fantastic to have you here to share your expertise. Uh, Start by telling us a bit about yourself and why you're the right person to talk to us about hospitality business management. Hey, Danny, great to join you today. Um, Yeah, well, um, there's lots of people with uh, lots of good ideas, I guess, at this this time. Uh, Back in the 90s, had a restaurant and cafe in Sydney for 10 years and uh, had the sort of dream of having my own business uh, from a completely different background, really enjoyed that. And then uh, sold the business back in the uh, late 90s and then went into the consulting side and advisory side of restaurants and cafes and uh, enjoyed that and um, built up a business called Profitable Hospitality, which most of uh, our services were online. And uh, I guess through that and uh, all through a lot of training I used to run, just got to meet hundreds and hundreds, maybe, I don't know if it was thousands of uh, business operators who were either running businesses or they ran some classes, a lot of classes for people who wanted to start as well. So uh, I keep those conversations going now. I um, joined a company called Silver Chef about four years ago when they bought my business and uh, still in the my main focus is, you know, business education for our customers and, and the industry. And uh Boy, last six months, you know, because it started when the fires hit in Christmas time. Um, it's like nothing we've ever seen before, is it? So all the advice we thought was good advice before, we're having to <laughs> relook at it and think about it again. Yeah, well, I suppose no one really reckons hospitality was in a brilliant spot before the summer. Um, so, I mean, you're in a good position to do a bit of an overview of the hospitality industry. So can you can you do that? Like talk about where it was and what's happened. Yeah, well, you know, one of the, the things that is always a burden for people is very high rents. And in Australia, for various reasons, you know, retail rents are very high, Main Street rents or shopping centre rent. So that is kind of like a a very heavy fixed cost that has to be borne by a business, whether it's a quiet week or a busy week. Um, So that's that's the start of kind of the burden. Um, And then, you know, there's no barriers of entry if you've got a new strip of shops open up under a block of flats, which every block of flats in the street seems to have new shops underneath it. You know, there's more competitors arising so uh, anyone can open a place uh, pretty simply it doesn't mean they're going to succeed but while they're there and uh, doing discount coffees and things like that they're uh, eating away at everyone else's business so you know endless competition um, yeah high fixed costs and I have mixed feelings about saying high wage costs in Australia because on the one hand uh, yeah, 20 bucks, 25 30 dollars an hour um, on weekends or something is is high, but these are some of the lowest paid people in the country. So, uh, yeah, we've got to sort of solve that problem. Yeah, we've got to solve that problem. Mm. Well, well, we'll dig into industrial reform in a, in a later episode, but um, definitely wage costs are, of, of course, you know, a big part of the way restaurants need to try to balance the books. Um, what about the, the way that restaurants tend to operate? What kinds of things have you noticed um, uh, through your journey? Yeah, well, uh, one of the things that's, that the smart operators are, are grabbing hold of very quickly at the minute in this, you know, difficult COVID-19 time is using technology much more more cleverly and much more um, carefully to whether it's managing purchases or managing their roster, um, letting people order online, handling the bookings, keeping track of all the numbers. And 
the numbers are something that people in hospitality have traditionally been pretty weak with, uh, whether it's just, you know, costing the recipe that we're going to be using of the seafood pasta and, you know, working out how much each of those prawns cost um, or looking at, you know, our projections ahead for our um, labour costs over the next few weeks. A lot of business has been what I call rear vision uh, management where you're looking at the rear vision mirror and seeing what happened last week or the week before and, oh, dear, that wasn't very good, was it? But, you know, we've actually got technology and um, simple ways to look ahead now and do, you know, more projections and more planning. So, yeah, we've got um, kind of tools at our fingertips at very low cost that we didn't have five years ago, ten years ago. There's, it's exciting, really, if we want to really – kind of manage our business uh, much more carefully. I guess so many hospitality businesses are, are built on passion, you know, someone's great idea or someone's desire to have a restaurant, you know, to, the, you know, the, all those people that are told, oh, you should open a restaurant, this is delicious. Um, the, the, the hospitality business owners are not always the most sort of, I guess, steely-minded when it comes to business, are they? Yeah, that's that's right. And, um uh, Look, I love, you know, someone does amazing baking, fantastic. Um, but, you know, the difference between a tray of uh, pastries from my friends coming around, oh, they're a bit late and those ones in the corner, they're a bit burnt. No, it's all right, it's fantastic. Whereas uh, people forget that actually it's manufacturing you're going into. And manufacturing means absolute rock-solid reliability. I want the same chocolate croissant when I buy it today or when I buy it next week. I want, you know, that reliability and manufacturing means, you know, expensive equipment. It means, um, you know, strict processes. There's a lot. I think it's important to think about. It's not, in a way, it is a little factory and that is the disciplines associated with that. And, you know, we don't, we can't have tolerance for fault or for kind of weakness or lateness or those sort of things. That doesn't work. And I suppose the pandemic has has highlighted the fact that you can't. There's no tolerance for uh, being disorganised at the back end of a business as well. Yeah, one of the things that's really uh, highlighted a weakness for a lot of people is around uh, run, running their books and running their numbers, keeping track of those. Because suddenly we had an unprecedented amount of uh, financial support come in whether for JobKeeper or, you know, state governments were giving away $10,000 grants for almost just, you know, almost no reason um, and, you know, tax refunds, all sorts of things like that. But you had to have your books update. You had to be able to prove, say, your takings were down 30% or 70% or something like that and you had to be able to verify that. And uh, a surprising number of people just couldn't keep up with that or they were late with it. Um, so, you know, it's not about lecturing people that, you know, you should know your weekly wage costs and your food costs. Well, you should. But if you've got a nice, well-organised set of books, you could just press the button and pull off a profit and loss to show that you, say, your sales were down, get that straight into the uh, tax department and your job keeper came through, payments came through first while other people were still struggling. So... Yeah, number a good set of numbers um, and kind of appreciation of the importance of that is pre, is uh, really, I think more and more people are understanding that. Mm. So, what kinds of things do you uh, suggest to people that they can do to improve the way their businesses are run? So, I think one of the things, let's say, just around the numbers and things like that, is get get some helpers. Don't pretend that you're able to do all these things, and people. Uh, you know, when they think of cost cutting, and that's that's often a reflex when when suddenly there's a downturn. Well, we've got to cut cut costs. Well, of course you've got to look at costs carefully, but um, cut fat, don't cut muscle. You know, and muscle might be the fact that there's someone who's offsite who looks after your book work and reconciles it all and pays all the bills for you and all those sorts of things, and that means it's all up to date. Don't by any means cut that person out and say, oh, we can do that. Uh, a lot of businesses actually say they can do it and they do it all themselves and it falls hopelessly behind. So that's one of the things, keeping track of the numbers. And then I'm a big fan of having good online rostering because your wage costs are usually your largest single cost 
certainly the one that people complain about. And if you have good rostering, all your staff can access their roster very quickly. You can see right up to you know the end of lunchtime today what our wages were and, and make adjustments if our sales were a bit down, that sort of thing. So just, yeah, putting those things, uh, you know, in place I think is pretty really important. I was just going to say uh, this: the question of you know cutting fat, not muscle. I was like, "Where's the fat?" Because I can sort of hear in the back of my mind a lot of business owners saying, "I've got no fat. I've got nowhere to cut." Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a good question. Um, well, I think they kind of interpret fat. See, um, there might be you know certain times of the week you think, "God, we're a bit overstaffed this week, aren't we?" Um, uh, gosh, do we really need uh, a cleaner to come in and do the cleaning in the morning? Can't the staff do that at the end of the night? Can't they clean the toilets? <laughs> you can see where this is going. <laughs> and, you know, things around hygiene practices uh, easily kind of there's, you know, they're shortchanged um, or, uh, yeah, we might be going for, you know, cheaper cuts of meat or certain things like that or go for suppliers who are offering much better prices or, you know, slightly better prices, but they don't have the reliability about delivery and those sorts of things. So Sure, there's trade-offs. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, I guess each business has to work out for itself where, where the fat is, but, I mean, a lot of businesses just don't have much. But I, I hear what you're saying, you know, it's like the, the experts that you've got in to help your business run better, That that is not the place to to well they're, they're not the people that you want to abandon they're the people that you want sort of side by side with you in the trenches working out how to do things better yeah yes mm-hmm. so some of the i suppose a lot of people have talked about the pandemic as an opportunity to reset to do things differently you know for you know we never have time to think we never have time to 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 reset to recharge and, and this is the opportunity what i'm saying as people reopen is that a lot of people are just diving back into the way things were. It's, it is really hard to force change in this industry. One of the things that people always talk about is that they need to raise prices. Is it that simple or why isn't it that simple? Yeah, I, I, I guess I get a bit impatient about that sort of thing. Look, um, pricing is there's so many interesting aspects to pricing. Um, I mean, I use Apple computers. Why do I pay twice as much for a computer if I got a PC? Is it, you know, they've sort of <laughs> woven this kind of mystique around, you know, Apple products that we pay more. I, I think they're good too, but it's definitely, there's an irrational element. And, and the more you can have it, something irrational and emotional around going to your place and eating your food and having your incredible pastries or whatever, you will pay more within reason. But as soon as you take away the magic um, and I just look at what's on the plate, it's like who says it's worth that? And this is where, you know, when I hear these arguments, people are just forgetting that there's a sort of magical element around pricing. But there's also an economics uh, 101 argument that, you know, when you raise the price of any product, people oftentimes the consumption goes down you know when the minute strawberries are eight dollars ninety in my local supermarket now i love strawberries on my breakfast virtually every morning but i'm not buying them okay so yeah move on to apples yeah we, we kind of forget that the iron laws of economics apply to our business as well if if and the more we make our product just as just a standard plain, you know, pasta carbonara, the same as everyone else does, um, people will start to look at prices. I mean, you can you can nudge prices up, 20 cents more on a coffee, those sorts of things. Um, but it's this kind of argument that uh, people should pay more just because don't they realise how good quality, don't you realise how high my price, my costs are? People don't care. And, um, yeah, they... <laughs> They really don't. They don't want to hear hard luck stories from restaurateurs. But, I mean, hopefully they don't also want their restaurant to not be able to make any money, therefore it goes out of business. It's it's a it's a really it's a tr- it's a tricky one, and I, I mean also restaurants are a place to create the magic and the mystique. So is that an answer that like sure put your price uh, of a dish up two dollars, but you need to have a little bit of extra magic to to account for that price rise? Yeah, and again create the magic that people actually want, not the magic that you think they want. Like you know, I'm of a 
generation where I go to most places and I think this is so loud, this is really uncomfortable. And I look around and most people are, you know, baby boomers like me, just like, <laughs> who chose this music? <laughs> now, I won't get onto that, you know, that uh, thing that I like to beef about. But, you know, just be really conscious about all the elements that go together to create a, a magical, wonderful experience that you want to go back many times over. Um, we should be in the business of creating customers who never leave us alone. They keep coming back, you know, and, uh, yeah. Well, well, what are some of the things that people can do? How do you how do you create those rusted-on customers that just cannot get enough? Yeah, well, I think one thing is, you know, the flavours and, you know, the, the actual thing that's in the takeaway box or on the plate when we sit down or in the cup. Um, but I think there's a lot around... Um, comfort, and by that I don't mean armchairs, you know, cafe, my favourite local one is just we're on stools and I don't even like stools, but, you know, but there's recognition and they don't know my name, but they always nod and they kind of usually remember what my coffee is and things like that. So, you know, there's lots of small elements like that. There's always something that keep little subtle differences and there's things what I call quality signals. Like they always have beautiful fresh flowers. You know, it's like a $20 bunch of flowers, not an $8 bunch of flowers. <laughs> you know, just little touches and the uniforms never look like they've been washed, you know, a thousand times. They're always looking kind of fresh and people are groomed, staff are groomed and they still wear their own clothes. But there's obviously a standard they have to conform to and there's just multiple little quality signals you know, the plates are kind of quirky and I did do what restaurant people like to do, lift, turn the plate over one time to have a look at the brand. <laughs> and it's just another brand from China, you know. But, again, all these little elements together create yeah, something that's special and different. I suppose other, there are other ways that owners can take the pressure off themselves a little bit in terms of thinking they need to raise prices. So one of those is around booking policies. No-shows are obviously crippling for restaurants, especially now when numbers are restricted. So what, what sort of advice would you have for people around booking policies? Yeah, look, this is uh, the old, I think Obama said it, probably others too, you know, don't waste a crisis. And this is time to really toughen up on um, rules about booking, especially for key times, like, you know, whether it's a weekend evening or Sunday brunches or whatever, but time for um, deposits and cancellation fees because all that can be done through apps now, you know, the booking app. So when we book for six people for Sunday brunch at 11 o'clock, we have to book using the app and we have to pay a deposit of $25 per person and it's not refundable or whatever, whatever your rules might be. But, you know, explain these things and, you know, say it with a smile, but, you know, tough love because, you know, in restaurants we've, we've been sort of telling people, no, you can't, with a smile in lots of different ways for a long time. This is just something we've been a bit neglectful around. I, I think I get a bit impatient sometimes, so, you know, it can be devastating if you can only see 10 and half of them don't turn up. But I think, boy, if you can only see 10, I would be wanting full payment <laughs> for, for those people, you know, while that situation arises. So we, we've got a chance to reset some of the rules, I think. Right. So you, you think people should take that chance and, and be firm, but then it's about how you deliver the message as well. Yeah. Firm and friendly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely friendly. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I know you're big on a diverse income streams and that's something I suppose a lot of businesses have tried at, at least with takeaway during this period. Can you talk a, a bit more about your views on that and what you what kinds of things you think restaurants could give a go? Yeah, well, there's um, the takeout and the delivery suddenly sprung into life and that, that was hard for a lot of places because they weren't, the places weren't engineered and set up for that and you know, if they did it themselves, that's they realised, boy, those poor old Uber drivers, what a tough life they have. Or you you got Uber or Delivery to do it and you gave them 30 to 35%, um, which is, just doesn't work. <laughs> but, you know, there's meal packs, there's um, take-home, you know, meals for later, there's family packs. People are inventing lots of different things 
and there's a little bit of people waiting for, oh, my God, I can't wait to get back to normal when we can get rid of all that stuff. But I actually feel that those extra food products, if you can just kind of engineer them um, the right way and get your pricing right and, you know, then get the sales of those sort of things happening with maybe impulse sales or just suggestive selling on your menu as well. That can be another good source of income. It may only be 10, 15, 20%, but that's diversification because we were so dependent on one product only and suddenly we were told to close and we had nothing. So, yeah, there's that. There's, you know, whether it's you've got a room that can be rented out for parties, functions, um, something that I think restaurateurs, restaurants could do a lot that aren't open in the day is have your room available for meetings and functions. But don't forget people want to, if you've got, say, going to have your place available for a sales meeting or just a standard boring business event of something like that, they want it reconfigured and they want, you know, coffee on arrival and continual coffee and all those things that people get at um, four- and five-star hotels, and they make a fortune out of this sort of plain vanilla kind of meeting spaces. But, boy, restaurants have got so much, uh, so many square metres available that they could be selling in the same way if they just can re-engineer it a little bit. You'd have to say a lot of that uh, that custom would be up for grabs at the moment as well with events being so disrupted and also with so many companies uh, having people working from home. Now we are able to gather in, in some numbers. So I think there would be a lot of that trade that uh, restaurants could target. Yeah, and it's much more interesting to sit around in it in an interesting restaurant than in a plain, you know, beige hotel room with white tablecloths. <laughs> I think there's opportunities there. Yeah. I mean, something a lot of restaurants have been doing is uh, selling, helping out their producers and selling some of that produce direct to consumers. And I think that's something that restaurants could do a bit more of as well is, is maintaining those, those connections. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that, I think that can be a nice, um, yeah, just just need to watch the costing of all those sorts of things um, because people certainly responded to having produce boxes or just being able to buy sugar or, you know, eggs and things like that. But the margins on those things is pretty, pretty tiny. So we just got to weigh up. But, it, but if, say, you're buying extra eggs and you were, you know, once they'd been on the shelves – for two days, then they went into the kitchen to be used for production. That's a nice way to, um, yeah, kind of expand. But I don't think, I don't think um, just becoming a little grocery, sh- you know, having a few grocery shelves is going to make sure. too much money. Um, do you think that there's, you know, you mentioned at the start of our chat, you know, that every new uh, apartment development has a cafe down below. Do you think the bar is too low for people who want to start a restaurant or cafe? And do you think you know, the industry would be better if it was a bit harder to open something up? There's hardly any bar. <laughs> well, you've got to have a great, you've got to have a grease trap, and uh, you've got to have, um, you know, exhaust if you're going to be cooking and you know frying. But oftentimes that's all been set up in a lot of those developments. But, um, you know, our, our, our free enterprise system, it's basically, you know, up for grabs, um, all these spaces. Uh, it's a blight on a lot of streets, isn't it, to see empty shops or, you know, failed shops. And, boy, there's a lot more now. So, yeah, I, I don't see a way that that's going to be changed um, except more people not making impulsive emotional decisions to open a cafe when we don't need another one. Do you reckon that in your when you've been you know consulting to people that you've headed off a lot of people from opening a, a soon to fail cafe? Yeah, look, look the way I, I, for a long time I used to run a, a a day course for people starting a cafe and restaurant, and we talk all about trends and customers and employment, and I always used to leave the numbers till the last. Because then I would just go through and explain the idea of break-even point, which is, you know, the idea that you've got your fixed costs like rent and they're the main leasing costs and then you've got to pay for those fixed costs with the profit on every plate you make, you know, a plate of pasta or something. And only when you've paid all your fixed costs, then you can start to make a profit. Anyway, we just, I just gently put the numbers together and that's when the penny would drop. 
and people were often in quite a bit of shock to think that, wow, is that really? You may, I mean, I'm really sick of my IT job or, boy, I wish I, I want to get away from teaching, but really take, you know, a cut to, you know, <laughs> half my wages and double my workload or something. So, yeah, But what about my food dream? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> what about helping people and, you know, being friendly to everyone, that sort of thing? It's, yeah. Numbers, a uh, good set of numbers makes a difference. Definitely. And, yeah, and being rigorous about those numbers at every step along the way. Um, a lot of, you know, it is hospitality and I think that people in, in, hospita in hospitality want to serve people and please people and they want to be able to say yes to most requests. But I feel like that that's meant that a lot of businesses have just tried to be everything to everybody and sort of lost focus on their core and, you know, what they were trying to do in the first place. Do you think that that's, uh, that that's an opportunity uh, to reset around the pandemic as well, to just stop doing so much? Mm. It, it is a tricky one, you know, because, you, and you see these people say, you know, we're in the business of saying yes, or, you know, the answer is yes, whatever. In fact, they pr often have, the ones that are successful, it's a bit of a PR thing, the way they say that, because they actually have quite kind of tight guidelines about, what's possible and within that they can say yes um but you know like we were talking about with cancellations before or just even variations on the plate you know like can i have mine with this or with that you know the whole thing of dietaries at the minute is a bit of a nightmare for a lot of operators because it's not like people are allergic to things they just prefer to have something different and you know it just slows up production in the kitchen so we've got to yeah just kind of go back to being a little bit stricter like we we're saying before you know strict with a smile and um yeah be a lot tighter around it were you really saying that you can say no to somebody's keto preferences on, on a menu is is that really okay in 2020 uh look if you find that in your area keto is big, have a whole keto section. Um, if, you know, this is what people are finding, say, with vegan options. They do a whole vegan section and it goes nuts. That is wonderful. So, you know, this is not about being, you know, cranky and old-fashioned, but, you know, go crazy on the keto or explain what it is, but don't let people... You know, if, you, if people want you to kind of change everything, that's what you do at home. You don't do it when you go out. So, yeah, keep, keep a close eye on what, what's, you know, what's popular in your area. Like, like one thing, you know, I know a perennial thing has been about, you know, sugar-free desserts. And I'm sorry, they just don't sell. They just don't sell, you know. <laughs> so we've tried that for years. <laughs> so you don't need to be all yeah. things to all people. No, no, but be a lot. But, but and, and again, just be constantly listening and testing and go and see what other people are doing well and keep your eyes wide open. Yeah, constantly researching and, um, yeah, smoke and mirrors. <laughs> that little bit of magic and that little bit of mistake and perhaps if you get it right, you can charge a couple of extra bucks for it as well. Absolutely, absolutely. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love people, I love it when people are, the most expensive place in the street, they're always full. I don't mean because they're, you know, $100 a head place, but just, you know, their coffee's 50 cents more and their pastries, you know, 80 cents more and it's a $12 sandwich, just not a $9 sandwich. I love that. So they're, they're obviously able to communicate the value. Yeah, yeah. Mm. All the value is just there. It's it's. Yeah, it's obvious to their customers. Um, okay, well, Ken, let's finish with a little bit of positivity and let's look at the opportunities that have come out of the pandemic. If a business was looking to, to reset, to forge on, to do better than, than they've ever done before, what kinds of things would you advise them to do and to look at now? So one thing we talked before about rent, so now's the chance to have a really tough decision either with your current landlord or look at somewhere else because there are going to be landlords who are, you know, really needing to do deals, really deal. And, you know, the, see, you've got a lot more room to move if you d got your rent down. You know, rents, if that's your rent's like 10, 12, 14% of your 
sales. That's crazy. You know, that's just too expensive. But if you can get your rent way, way down, then you've got more freedom to, you know, be keep your costs maybe, your menu prices down a little more and things like that. So one opportunity is, you know, much harder negotiation around occupation costs. Um, and I'm actually not in favour of cutting wages, but I am in favour of keeping your wage costs down because you're watching that much more closely and aligning the labour to when you're busy. So every time it's busy, we've got enough staff and there's no one looking around thinking, where's my waiter? <laughs> Why is this table still dirty? <laughs> That's not the magic and mystique either. No. And, and in per, for purchasing, you know, your, your food. Now, um, well, beverage has been pretty well organised, you know, with, say, wine and, and uh, other beverages online but you've got some terrific uh suppliers now and they've all pretty much gone online so you can go online you can find the best prices you can do deals you can actually really calibrate that stuff and then you can feed it into your own kind of recipe costing systems and things like that so you can really watch all these costs so tightly and if your people are prepared to start to you know watch the numbers and not say that's that's too hard and that makes my head hurt. <laughs> you know, watching those numbers, you've got the systems, you've got your bookkeeping and everything like that, that you can be yeah, just keeping a really tight eye on thing. And then you've got fantastic, through social media, fantastic promotional opportunities as well to be, you know, pumping up Monday night if that's quiet or um, promoting, you know, a new function venue or, the, the daytime, um, so you know, meeting space that you've got to set up in your restaurant or something like that. So yeah, a lot more. De- you've got opportunities to really get into the details a lot more easily and, and and kind of leverage them. And so, what's the mindset? Is it a scary time or is it an exciting time? Um, let's not underestimate how difficult it is emotionally for people. This is you know, there's a huge amount of stress, but. Um, it's yeah it's a time for incredible resilience and sadly there's a lot of people who haven't had that strength for all sorts of reasons and they just have they're not going to make it through but for people who can really hopefully they're not too indebted you know they they've got I'm not saying they've got lots of money in the bank but they're not you know too burdened by debt there's op- terrific opportunities there but the industry is going to be smaller and people are going to be poorer and we've got to be ready to offer, you know, terrific value. But people, Aussies love to go out. They want to eat out. They want, you know, they're just going to trade down. Mm. Yeah, well, I think there's going to be a lot of restaurants and cafes that will be ready to meet people where they are and to make the most of it in their own businesses. Um, thank you so much, Ken, for sharing all your advice and yeah, tips born of your own experiences. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Enjoyed it very much. Thanks, Jenny. Cheers. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production.